Welcome to God is Open. I'm your host, Christopher Fisher. Today on God is Open, we are going to be going over the preface to my book, God is Open. Now, I thought this might actually be useful because I'm trying to run my oldest kids, take them through my entire book this summer. And um, it, it, it struck me going through the preface that this is not this is not like a sixth grade reading comprehension level type of book. It might be a little bit elevated. So it might be worth going through and talking about some of the issues and talking about some of the thought processes, just doing a running commentary on the preface. And then uh, we'll see how long it gets. Um, I, I do got the preface recorded by at least two individuals, two different people at two different points of time have offered to turn my book into audiobook. And uh, I'm, I'm w willing to accept anything like that. Um, I told maybe one or both of them, I said that uh, I would give them the rights to it if they want to put it on Audible and then get all all the revenues. So, um, but again, it's, it's a long book. It's a difficult book. So whether anyone's actually going to build an audio file for the whole thing, you know, it's up in the air whether that will ever happen. But I am going to go hit play and then we will start listening through this book and then we could talk about some of the issues that it talks about. Narrated by Kenny Burchard. This book is dedicated to my father, who exemplified intellectual integrity throughout my life. Preface. Open theism can rightly be divided into two camps. Those who accept openness based on philosophy and those who accept openness based on the biblical witness. Yeah, so the, the book is kind of written towards people who have some basic familiarity with the open theist debate, the op op issues within open theism. So it's it's going to be, uh, if someone just opens this up without that, uh, that a little bit of background knowledge, they might be lost right away what's going on here. This book will only deal with the biblical case for open theism. Particularly of interest will be understanding what each individual author in the Bible attempted to communicate to their respective audiences. Now, this is actually critical to this book. So this book is is more of a study. This this book is more of a scholarly endeavor to try to look at the Bible through neutral or objective lenses. So it's it's not the, the whole book is not about trying to say, hey, let's build this uh, grand theology that's going to make everything work together. This book really is. Let's see what the individual texts say and try to get meaning out of uh, isolated passages. This seems like the most natural and honest way to treat the text. After all, the author's intended audience would have to come to the text with the same assumptions. It will be assumed that the author was genuine and not trying to mislead their audience. This yeah, so this is actually pretty critical. Uh, there, there's that book, uh, I, I don't know which book I'm reading, but... Uh, it does mention me in it. It's it's. I'll have to pull up the title or something like that. But but the book was talking about open theism and different ways that open theists approach the Bible. And it mentions oh Chris Fisher, but he wrote this book on open theism, and it's just this very simplistic take. Okay, what are the other options? What are the other options for reading the Bible? Either we could read it as we would any other text, use basic reading comprehension when when approaching it, not Try to try to decrease any biases we have. Try to eliminate or mitigate our biases, and just try to see the text as it is. What's your other options? Your other options is come to the text with this ad hoc, spiritual, special pleading to try to make the text whatever way you want. That's not a good way to read the text. It 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 doesn't it doesn't give you something concrete or objective. It's just subjective in that case, and uh, it has no base in reality. This approach is the most probable method to lead the reader to understanding biblical theology. The question is not, how do we build a philosophy that fits all the writings of the Bible? Nor is it, how do we build a theology that fits nicely together? But instead, what theology was advocated by each individual writer of the Bible, and does it fit together? What each author was attempting to communicate to their reader is much more important than trying to force every yeah that the book actually is uh what is it god in motion and it does do a summary of open theism and does mention me and says this guy just reads the the bible simplistically i'll take it i'll take it but i don't think there's another option 
You could do the Greg Boyd thing where you have a Christocentric approach towards the Bible, and so everything's reread in light of this hermeneutic that you came up with yourself. You could do that, but that it seems baseless. It's, it seems very arbitrary to import those types of standards. Free text into a uniform. Yeah, David writes, The Strangers at the Mall Razor. And it might, that actually might be mentioned within the chapter one of this book, but probably not the preface. Framework. Where many theologians err is trying to force theology into texts where it doesn't belong. They will superimpose later ideas on earlier narratives. One example of this type of theological thinking is found in Calvinist circles. Some key doctrines of Calvinism rely heavily on the works of Paul, arguably taken out of context. Yeah, I was, I was going for some sort of neutral example because it's, it's not like Calvinism is the big boogeyman that you want to fight. You just want to grab an example that people might be familiar with, they might identify with. And I probably should have picked something other than Calvinism because it's a very contentious subject, but it's something that people can understand. When asked where these doctrines are advocated in the rest of the Bible, often Calvinists cannot answer. The theological assumptions of Calvinism are just not found uniformly in the Bible. It is a mistake to force authors who lived centuries before the New Testament into a theology that is tenuously derived from the New Testament. The more textually focused Calvinists claim that biblical theology is progressive and that Israel was growing theologically over the Old Testament and into the New. But yeah, and so a good example of that is uh, <laughs> the Old Testament passages about you don't you don't find any Old Testament passages prohibiting prostitution, right? And so um, th there are some things where a priest's daughter can't be a prostitute, but there there are prostitute instances in the the Old Testament which are not condemned, and it's not like a moral law that is blanket condemned within the Old Testament. So. It would be a mistake to turn to the writings of Paul and see, say, look, Paul condemns it here, here, and here. These are bad things. You don't want to unite yourself to a prostitute. The, uh, the, the two become one in the biblical model, so don't do it. And then take Paul's reading and then, then apply that retroactively to the Old Testament. Like, they were all of the same opinion. They were all of the same mindset. More likely, Paul is expanding on a principle for the benefit of his hearers in his particular space and time. Probably, it's it's probably a mistake to read Paul back into previous texts where it doesn't belong. So that, that might be another example of that. But then they have to abandon strict inerrancy of the Bible, claiming the Old Testament writers did not have the full theological picture. The Calvinist has then given up or redefined their claim of biblical inerrancy, something which some Calvinists gladly do. To stay with the example, the less scrupulous Calvinist who wishes to preserve a claim of biblical inerrancy will claim that each individual author agreed with Calvinism, but wrote in a cryptic way to their audience. John Calvin wrote that God lisps to man as a... Uh, yeah, you, you actually see this illustrated in my debate with uh, Daniel Madden. And he said, oh, yeah, Isaiah talks like this. Uh, God's watching, God's learning, God's thinking, God's responding. But the author secretly believed Calvinism. It fits with my, my theology because in my theology, people could re write like that for normal people, for their comprehension, but have a secret Calvinist theology. So all the texts work and they fit my model. But the problem is, the problem is, as Will Duffy says, it's just not in the text. What, what you're claiming is just not there, and you just have to read, read that into it and assume that into it. Nursemaid to a child. This approach does great harm to the integrity of the text, and is even less helpful than philosophical debates for determining any sort of truth. After all, who determines which texts have special hidden meanings? How does an observer objectively pick which proof texts do not have a... Yeah, if, if your hermeneutic is not... An objective hermeneutic that a wide variety of people can agree to, people who don't actually hold your worldview, there might be something wrong with your hermeneutic. It might be special pleading. And so probably the best hermeneutic that uh, probably the most widely accepted among various disciplines might be something like canonical criticism, in which the whole Bible is seen as a completed work, finished work. 
and then it's read in that light. Now, what did the audience mean to communicate, or what what did the author mean to communicate to the their specific audiences at their particular place at their particular time? And then also, what's the editor doing, uh, putting certain works in certain places, certain arrangements in certain ways? Why were some things left in and some things taken out? What's the goal of the editor? So there's there's a lot of different perspectives that we're looking at when you're, we're looking at the Bible. We can't just treat it like a homogenous whole that just uh, came down, it, maybe like uh, like one of those Book of Mormon things where he digs up the plates and he pulls it out of the ground and he has a whole and completed work. We shouldn't be seeing the Bible like that. It's, it's a developmental document that grew and changed and morphed over a series of thousands of years. Straightforward meaning, and which ones do? For the Calvinist, how does one argue that Malachi 3.6 means God is immutable, while at the same time arguing that Genesis 6.6 6 helps the reader understand an eternal plan of God? Is it not just as possible, or more so, that Malachi 3.6 helps the reader understand God's commitment to Israel, and Genesis 6.6 6 is absolute? Spiritualization or marginalization of the text is unhelpful and ultimately ends up substituting preconceived philosophy as the metric for interpreting the text. Philo so the idea here is that we need consistent standards. We need standards that we just don't make up ourselves, some sort of standard that can be agreed to by third parties who don't have stake. They don't have a dog in the fight uh, when coming to the Bible, or else, or else our reading of the Bible is subjective. We could just make up whatever we want, and that's what the Bible means. I don't think that's a very probable way. It'd be like throwing a dart at a huge, huge map of the world, let's let's say, and then trying to hit like Luxembourg or something like that, and you're like like a hundred meters away. You're not you're not gonna be able to do it. The, the chances are astronomical that if you're just coming up with truth in your own head, um for for uh, reading the Bible, like, oh I, I we need to read the Bible like this and this and this. Chances are you're not going to get anything close to an objective reality. It's just going to be you making up stuff. So it's it's unhelpful and uh, not very convincing to third parties who don't already agree with you. Philosophy has its place. But with philosophy, as with any other field based on introspection, the field does not have concrete answers. Andrew writes, why is the open view the ultimate boogeyman? I, I think that's because it it offers something that classical theism hasn't had to deal with since uh, uh, the early centuries. Of course, they they were dealing with uh, p pieces and portions of that through throughout uh, throughout all of history. John Calvin writes about those terrible open theists, but it hasn't been a movement that they've actually had to confront because they've they've had a monopoly on pub publishing uh, publications and a monopoly on the clergy. And so they haven't had to fight these fights. And now they're getting frustrated. They don't have the tools. The tools that they have disclaim and discount the Bible. Open theism, a biblical open theism, seems to be the best way to read the Bible because it's the most straightforward. It's the most intuitive way to read the Bible. And they're threatened by that. Reasonable people might come to opposite conclusions. It's much harder to argue that one's... Yeah, that's, that's another incredibly important thing to understand is that language is loose. Language doesn't have definitive meaning. Context gives meaning. Context can point us towards the truth of what something's trying to say. Context can point us to uh, the possible meanings. But we should be very careful to claim that we have absolute truth on our side. Uh, you, you see... Uh, I, I when I was talking to my kids about this chapter because I'm taking them through this book this summer, I said rain is stink. My daughter's name's Rain. I said rain is stinky. Okay, so what does that that statement mean? And it, one of my boys was like, "Oh, she smells and she smells all the time." It's like, well, I I say it to her sometimes. It's it's just like a joke. It's just like uh, me being playful with her. It's not really true. It's just to get a rise. And so what what's the surrounding context? The context gives the phrase meaning. The phrase doesn't stand alone. There's there's all sorts of meaning that can be attributed to this one phrase, depending depending on the context. And you just see that in your in your in your normal interactions with people. Uh, you could tell kind of when they're joking or when they're kind of tongue in cheek or or when they're half serious saying something. And 
Um, so just the, the context determines meaning. The word, the words don't have absolute meaning in and of themselves. And this is true. You could just turn to any dictionary and you can see a whole host of various definitions for the same word. On top of that, you have other contextual meanings. You have idioms. Uh, one, one example that Bob Enyard always used to give is her elevator doesn't go to the top floor. Now, this doesn't mean that she has an elevator and her elevator is broken or her elevator is programmed that it doesn't it means that she's she's missing something mentally she might not be all there mentally she's a few fries short of a happy meal these type of idioms have meaning and not literal meaning but let's say we're in the context of we're talking about a very rich lady and she owns a building and uh, we, we talk about her elevator that people take up and down all the time. And then I say, oh, her elevator doesn't go to the top floor. The context is kind of, you're probably going to say, well, she, that he's probably talking about the elevator in the story in which she owns this building and this elevator that we're talking about. And so it's probably a literal elevator. But if it was a standalone phrase, you'd probably not guess that at all. This philosophy is true than to argue which specific theology was held by individual biblical writers, or anyone for that matter. Whereas philosophy has unlimited flexibility, there is only so much flexibility in trying to represent the beliefs of the biblical writers. Pressing it too hard causes it to break. So philosophy is good, and philosophy is useful, and it's fun to talk philosophy, and it's interesting to talk philosophy with others. But if you're talking to a bad actor, someone who's not interested in truth, they're not interested in understanding you, it's going to be a complete waste of time. So philosophy probably should be regulated to people who care about each other, who want to have intellectual conversations and get down to the truth of matter and explore ideas. It's not for debate. <laughs> it, 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 turned, it just turns into a big dumpster fire. So that's not the debate I typically want to have. It's good and fun to talk philosophy with individuals uh, who who you have some sort of basis with, some sort of relationship with. But those those hostile individuals, those people who are just looking for a fight, looking to destroy you, looking to to lie about you, lie about you to your face and disclaim everything you believe, uh, you don't want to have philosophical debates with those people. They, they're not interested in understanding your points. And so a biblical debate is much more interesting and much more fun because uh, they hem and haw. Uh, they don't like the text of the Bible. The text of the Bible, that, again, the Bible is not a work of philosophy. Yeah, there's philosophy in it, but it, it's not. It's not like a uh, epistemology text. Or like it's not. It's not about how do we know what we know. It's not a metaphysical text. It's it's a practical text. It's about. How do we live our best lives in relation to God? It's a historical text. How, how have people interacted with God throughout all of history? It's not a systematic theology. And so God is a person within the Bible. And if you're debating someone and they want God to be a metaphysical formula, abstract formula in the ether, that's just not what the Bible is, and you're going to win every single one of those debates. It's it's not hard. You just read the Bible, you pull up the text, and you read them. And because, because legitimately, no kidding, none of the biblical authors had Calvinist ideas about God. They didn't have these metaphysical systems that are going on in the background. Every single one of their proof texts, if read in context, uh, it is, it's just a, there's a, just a normal reading behind it. God says, I change not, therefore you're not destroyed. Return to me, and then I'll return to you. Well, this is not him being metaphysically immutable or anything. There, that doesn't make sense in context. Instead, it's about his steadfastness to a people who he wants to kill and destroy. And uh, he's trying to goad them or try to get them to come back to him. And he's saying, I'll respond to you. Uh, you're, the reason you're still alive is I don't change. I'm not going to go back on my promise, but I would have killed you. Um, that should make you guys a little fearful, and then you should repent. You should come back to me, and I'll go back to you. This quid pro quo type of thing in their very proof text for immutability. Every one of their proof texts are just like that. You just you just have to turn to their proof text and read it and say, okay, what would a normal person read read in this proof text if they were laden down? with philosophy 
philosophical baggage that's just not in the text. Causing casual readers to question the integrity of the interpreter. Treating the Bible at face value eliminates much subjectivity. Philosophy might sound nice and might make people feel good, but good feelings have very little effect on differentiating what is real from what is fiction. As an example, it might sound nice to think that everyone in the world lives as millionaires, but our good thoughts do not change reality. It might sound nice that God has detailed and specific plans for every person's life, but the question remains, is it true? Subjective evaluations of the preferability of statements. Yeah, so if, if someone's using fallacious reasoning, they might accidentally be right in their beliefs. Like, let's say that uh, I looked at a clock, and the clock says 12, and I say, oh, it's 12 o'clock. And, uh, but I don't know that the, the watch is actually broken and it's just, just on 12 o'clock all day, every day. But it also perchance happens that just as I do that, it actually is 12 o'clock. You know, I could be accidentally right, but the way that I got there might be suspect or incorrect. And so logical fallacies work like that. It could be correct. You know, I really love kids. And therefore, I have a lot of kids. Is that, does that logically follow that just because someone likes kids, then they have a lot of kids? No, it doesn't logically follow. There's a lot of steps you need to do in order to have children, uh, just more than just liking kids. Um, there's a lot of childless cat ladies who would love to have a lot of kids, but just can't. There's a lot of steps that might, might be missing there, but it just happens to be true in my case. So coincidentally true things do happen, but we got to watch out for basing our beliefs off of malicious lo logic and reasoning because the chances that they're true are, are not very good. It, sound reasoning will lead you to better conclusions. ...have no effect on the truth of the statements. This cannot be stressed enough. As such, this work will deal specifically with determining what the authors of the Bible believed in spite of implications. If the Bible can be read in this fashion, then each biblical author will be allowed to communicate their own theology. The reader, in turn, will be left with two alternatives if they wish to remain true to the text. Either the reader can accept the biblical witness or reject the biblical witness in favor of philosophy. The purpose of this book is to explore the various portraits of God throughout the Bible, as presented by the individual authors. Attention will be given to how Yahweh is described, how he acts, and how he thinks. I, I do like that I chose the word portraits of God in that passage. And so, you know, kind of sometimes when you read your work that you haven't, you wrote it, but you haven't seen it in a while, you go back and read it again. And you're like, wow, that's a pretty good portion there. That That's a pretty good point that you like highlight it. It's like, these are good points. That's a pretty good word. Different authors have different portraits of God. Reading Ezekiel might be, look different, like a different portrait of God than uh, reading Matthew something like that. So uh, different people have different conceptions of God. Of course, in any relationship, if you have a relationship with a person, not everyone's going to have the same picture or idea or even general adjectives applied to individuals. Some people might say I'm nice. Some people might say I'm really mean. My kids, uh, th they think I'm, I'm nice for the most part. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm not always a nice guy. Some people really hate me. Implications will be explored. This book will focus on particularly interesting passages throughout the Bible. This will include common texts used by classical theologians, common texts used by open theists, and various overlooked texts. This by no means will be an exhaustive survey. The passages chosen will deal primarily with the nature and character of God. The context and meaning will be explored possible ranges of meaning will be discussed, and the limitations of interpretations will be determined. Normal reading comprehension will be the standard, using common communication standards, identifying possible figures of speech, cultural idioms, and metaphors. Context will be crucial, not only the context of the immediate point being presented, but the scope of the author's writing and possible cultural contexts. Yeah, that's actually pretty important. Uh, context is who... Who's writing? Who are they writing to? What's the circumstance? What kind of concepts are they already familiar with? Are there idioms that have been established? Are there ideas in their culture which have been established? 
context is not turning to a verse written 2,000 years later and then saying, oh, see, this verse says that, therefore, this verse back here, we need to translate in light of that, right? And let's, let's say you get a verse in the New Testament that says, no one has seen God at any time. And then you're looking at a verse maybe in Genesis 22 or in Exodus when God eats with man and say, because this verse in the New Testament says no one has seen God at any time, these times where Yahweh's talking to people, you know, we get we gotta we gotta make some sort of apology for this. We we got we gotta think of some way to get out of this where that's not actually God being seen. Now that's the wrong way to read the Bible in in this type of study where you're trying to figure out what the text means to its audience. You can't just assume, number one, you're assuming that that later text means something that's contradictory to the earlier text. And maybe maybe your problem is that later text, maybe you're reading that later text wrong. And more likely you are because that later text had access to those earlier texts. And so if if you're gonna read one in the light in light of the other, it's better to read the latter text in light of the former text than vice versa. Only in the preface and the last chapter will this work speak with a systematic theology in mind. Uh, Jeff says, whose book is being narrated? Well, my own book. Uh, we're, uh, here's, here's the quick, quick story again. I'm running my kids through my book this summer uh, for summer vacation. And uh, it appeared to me that this preface is not written at like a sixth grade reading comprehension level. It's, it's written at, you know, higher, maybe even a college type of level. And so it might be helpful to just kind of go through the preface and as far as we get and just talk about some of the concepts and expound on them because uh, some of them are co very complicated. This preface will be used to introduce the reader to the basic theological worldviews. The last chapter will be used to make sense of strong themes in the works of Israel. The middle chapters will examine theology from the perspective of individual authors, avoiding forced conclusions. Texts that the author had available will be assumed to have had influence. For example, the author of Isaiah most likely had access to Genesis and no access to Romans. Texts for future periods will only be referenced if it could help clarify the cultural meaning of a previous text. For instance, language scholar Joel Hoffman examines the use of covet throughout the Bible to determine possible word meaning by divergent contexts. Later texts will be considered if they show specifically how later generations understood previous texts, if there's a direct reference. But the general practice of using later texts to override and negate earlier texts will not be entertained. After this survey is completed, the next task will be to consider if there's some way that all the authors can be reconciled between each other. If this is possible, the result would be a biblical systematic theology. Yeah, so the claim of this book is not that you can find a biblical systematic theology, but there are trends and there are ideas and we can make generalizations based on what we see. I guess what, none of these guys are Calvinists. None of them have these classical Platonistic understandings of God. And so that much is very evident and th that much can be systematized. Other things, maybe not so much. This is not going to be a systematic theology in the normal sense, as the Bible does not entertain speculative metaphysics. The coherence of this new systematic theology would show that throughout several thousands of years, a consistent witness was given towards God. And this, in turn, would provide good evidence towards the opinion that the Bible is trustworthy. Consistency is axiomatic to trustworthiness. Inconsistent things are not true by definition. This biblical theology would be the starting point by which any historical biblical philosophy can be built. This study will not assume that the Bible is true. After all, before knowing if something is true, a reader has to understand what is being said. Those who begin to look at the Bible with the idea that the Bible is by necessity true often use their biases to force narrowly directed understandings of the text. This creates an intellectual hazard, as biases are used to override narratives. The text becomes pliable and able to support any conclusion, no matter how remote from the author's intent. Open versus Classical Theism Before embarking on the subject of open theism, stressed by the... So it's, it's good that the, this book actually 
gives an overview of some of these concepts that we're looking at. So uh, here's an introduction to classical theism. Here are the concepts, immutability, eternity, impassibility. I, I don't think I have uh, pure actuality as one of them. I kind of scroll through, but uh, I, I hit most of the major ones, God being outside of time. Um, but it's, it's good to understand that what those are and what negative theology is theology by negation that god can't be differentiated from nothingness is that's basically what negative theology is and i think i'd also quote um george h smith who wrote atheism the case against god and his his frustration with this type of negative theology in which god is nothingness it's really funny because some calvinists on facebook are very adamant that God is in fact nothingness. And uh, their big problem with open theism is they think that since open theism is part of the free will tradition, that open theists think that we spawn things from nothingness, whereas their contention is God's the thing that spawns from nothing. It, it's, it's this absurd, it, it, it's basically Platonistic, Platonistic hangovers that Christianity is enduring biblical authors. It is important to define the terms and understand the concepts. That way, when varying beliefs about the text are discussed, a reader can have insight into thinking of the adherents. It would not be of any good to criticize a classical belief or negative theology if the reader does not understand what that entails. Understanding worldviews will help a reader know the presumptions being brought onto the text from those that share the specific intellectual background. Open theism is simply the belief that God is free, dynamic, and loving. This is the primary message in the Bible. God is not constrained by immutability. And that might be a little bit rhetorical. Basically, open theism is the denial of classical attributes. And so, conceptually, someone could say that God's not loving and still be an open theist. But rhetorically, that works for the definition because that's typically how God is characterized in open theism, even though it's not, it's, it's not a sink or swim type of, type of attribute. But free to create and innovate. Open theism is then, at its core, the rejection of Platonic influence on the church. The Platonic influences posit a God of pure actuality, pure simplicity, which then necessitates an immutable and impassable God. Although some self-declared open theists add Platonic ideas into their overarching theology, open theism, as presented in this book, will be used to denote agnosticism on these attributes. These attributes are just not found in the biblical text. In contrast, the biblical story is that God is relational and dynamic. Pastor Bob Enyart of Denver Bible Church, an open theist, states, quote, The future is open because God is free and God is creative. The settled view of God denies God's own freedom and the ability to create, do something new, etc. God was, is, and always will be free. God was, is, and always will be a creative God. Close quote. This is really the heart of the matter. Who is God? The classical position is primarily a statement on the nature of God. Is God pure actuality, or can God become angry? Is God immutable? Or can God become sad? Is God impassable? Or can God feel emotions? Open theism states that God is free to do as God pleases. God can write new songs, create new relationships, and even change the future. This is the God that the Bible depicts. Yeah, it's, it's good to point out these illustrations so that people can conceptualize the options. So either God is a God who could change and innovate and, and do things. God has potency. I, I think that's really funny that Calvinists describe God as omnipotent, yeah, omnipotence. He has all potency, but they deny him potency, the ability to actually do things. He's, he's stuck in this fatalistic loop. He's, he's stuck it with whatever has been predestined to happen. He can't change. He can't deviate. Um, his very description in Calvinism is he's immutable, cannot change. He doesn't have potency. But, you know, so illustrating things like this when you're talking to normal individuals who don't care very much about theology, that's going to make it very, it's going to make it stick out 
uh, very acutely. A, a, a very, it'll stick out in their mind what open theism is, what it claims about God, and how it differentiates itself from the classical views. And I think it's, it's a very strong argument. People can relate to other people, people can't relate to nothingness. A God eternally interacting with his creation, reacting and moving, living and creating, planning and accomplishing all his goals. Open theism is the Christian doctrine that the future is not closed, but open because God is alive, eternally free and inexhaustibly creative. Biblical open theism is the belief that the Bible depicts God as God truly is. The God of the Bible is truly loving, powerful, righteous, faithful, vengeful, relational, creative, and desperately beautiful. God raises up nations and destroys them, Isaiah 40, 23, illustrated throughout the history of Israel. God is heartbroken by rebellion and exacts retribution, Genesis 6, 6-7, illustrating God's reoccurring judgments on mankind. God pleads with his people to return to him and attempts everything he possibly can to make them. So this is actually a really good summary. And unlike Calvinist shotgun proof texting, you could actually turn to all these references and see these things happening. And it, it frustrates uh, Calvinists. I, I had that two minute open theism video and it was uh, reviewed by Tim Hurd. And I was, I was describing this and I was flashing the verses on the screen and he was doing an audio presentation for his audience. And he seemed almost mad that I had verse references that I was flashing on the screen as I was describing this. But he didn't want to actually turn to any of them and see if they actually say what I'm claiming. So that was pretty funny. I'm loving Isaiah 5, 4, a consistent claim of Israel's prophets. God is nauseated by heinous sin, Jeremiah 19, 5, illustrated in God's judgment against Sodom. God sometimes even forgets his people's sin for God's own sake. Isaiah 43, 25, one of several strategies undertaken by God to reach Israel. God feels scorned and rejected when we abandon him. Hosea 1, verse 2, illustrated by God's vengeance against nations who reject him. But most interestingly of all, God is love. 1 John 4, verse 8. This is illustrated throughout the Bible. God so loved mankind that God made us in his image. Genesis 1, verse 26. God created man for a love relationship. Not dissuaded by a general moral decline, God even chose a special nation to be his priest people through which he could reach the world. Exodus 19, verse 6. God also so loved the world that he sent his only Son, that whosoever believes in him has everlasting life. John 3, verse 16. God describes himself as relational and powerful. God can do anything he wants. God can test people and learn that people love him. Genesis 22:12. God can listen to new songs, songs we write for him, Psalm 33, verse 3. And God can... Basically, this is just a shotgun proof texting throughout the Bible of all these different concepts. It, this would probably be, be pretty devastating in a one-on-one -on -one debate against a Calvinist. And you, you can actually throw that out and say, hey, let's go explore any of these texts that, that I'm talking about and see if it says what I'm saying. And then, then you can extrapolate, do the other verses that I'm quoting and the other references, do they also say the things that I'm saying? So I'm going to kind of skip forward so to the classical theism bit because, uh, you know, time's limited in, in this world. And we'll, we'll see if, uh, let's see if uh, 1854 After works. After questioned by Abraham, Genesis. Oh, forward more. It's going to just spin on me, I guess. Of biblical open theism. Classical theism, negative theology. When okay, so classical theism is negative theology. Negative theology is describing God through negation, describing God in such a way that you're not giving concreteness to who God is. And this this was the Platonistic way of talking about God and conceptualizing God. If you remember Plotinus's description of the one, he says, as soon as you utter the one, don't utter anything else. You can't actually ascribe predicates to God. And this type of language is echoed throughout the early church fathers that we can't give God predicates. We can't describe them in any way that's concrete because that's, that's creating parts in him. That's creating change. That's creating degradation. That's creating a decay within the Godhead. And so he can only be described and conceptualized through negation. Now, 
Now this has been watered down through the centuries. And so then you have people like Norman Geisler trying to ascribe God emotions yet claim that God is immutable. And they, they do this through various tricks of wordplay. Like one Calvinist that I went to college with, he said, okay, God is a light pole. And as we sin, we move away from that light pole. And as a result, it's, it's as if he's more angry with us. But what's really happening is we're just farther away from this standard. Okay, um, uh, yeah, maybe. But uh, you still are putting God in relation to an object. You're still adding complexity to God. You're still adding dependencies, interdependencies. You're still adding relationships, which defeats the whole metaphysics. This is what James Duesel talks against in all his books when he's he's trying to return to a classical view of simplicity. He's like, you can't be doing this, guys. We can't be giving God predicates like this. Um, it just violates our fundamental metaphysics, even though Calvinists, Calvinists like to do that. The Calvinists who aren't, aren't as, let's say, they're, they're not as fundamentalist in their classical theology, and they're, they're going to allow some slippage. When it comes to views about God, the main alternative is one imposed by the classical view. Classical theism, much like classical Greek literature, emphasizes the how much or how little attributes. These attributes are aimed at quantifying God, as opposed to qualifying God. Instead of God being described as a person, God is powerful. Love now, this was a simplistic way that Bob Anyart would describe basically the classical attributes versus the personal attributes. And... It's 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 basically dumbing it down to a sixth grade level. And so it, it's actually a pretty good way to conceptualize what's going on here, that uh, uh, the quantities versus the qualities, we, 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 how much power does God have? How much space does God take up? Even though in classical theism, he's he's outside of those conceptions of, of space and time. And in that way, he's omnipresent. But. Uh, just dumbing it down so people could understand the differences. Bob Ennert does a good job in using these adjectives. Uh, is, is this quantifying God or is this qualifying God? We care about God's qualities. We care about who he is as a person. We don't care about how much and how little, how capable he is, how much change does he have. And so it's it's included in the book because it's useful, but it's it's not... It's not technically correct. I guess that's what I'm getting at here. Loving, merciful, relational, etc. God is described as an object. How much space does God take up? How much power can God perform? How much knowledge does God have? How much change can God perform? How much can people affect God? The attributes quantify God. This theological approach is also known as negative theology because it emphasizes knowledge of God in wholly non-concrete ways because nothing can be said of God in any definitive sense. There is nothing God does not control, omnipotence. There is nothing that God does not know, omniscience. God cannot be constrained by space, omnipresence. God cannot be constrained by time, eternality. God cannot be moved by anything, impassibility. God cannot change, immutability. God cannot sin, impeccability. God cannot be described, ineffable. God has no parts, simplicity. These are negative attributes, because they do not give people tangible knowledge about God. Thus, they are negative, because they add nothing. These attributes do not give people an idea of who God is, but who God is not. None of uh, in, in the classical scheme of things, in the Platonistic text, you can't actually describe God in positives, because that would ground God to this world, and it would create change, it would create that decay. It would uh, destroy the Godhead, basically. And so all these attributes and ways of describing God are not meant to be distinct from each other. Like, uh, I think it's a, even James Duesel talks about that all God's attributes are identical to one another because God is simple. These are just different ways that we try to conceptualize the non-concept that is God within negative theology. One of these attributes distinguishes God from non-existence. Negative theology is fairly synonymous with classical theism, as classical theism, from Justin Martyr through modern theologians, has wholly endorsed the negative theological approach. Classical theism additionally tries to assign some positive attributes to God, such as goodness, but these positive attributes contradict the negative ones. As an example, 
immutability contradicts any personal attributes of God and must be qualified. For example, God's love is not like our love. Classical theists, to counter the tension, attempt to redefine much of negative theology, which, in turn, counteracts many of the solutions that negative theology brings to the philosophical debate. There are close relations between negative theology and the dignum deo mindset. Negative theologians often reason from a dignum deo presumption. Dignum deo theology is theology derived from what attributes God should have. Literally translated, dignum deo is that which is fitting of God. So yeah, let's, let's try not to confuse dignum deo with negative theology. They're, they're related, but they're not identical. Dignum deo, that's the moralistic fallacy, just pretending what we want to be true is true. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if uh, God was all loving and uh, let's just pretend for sake of argument uh, to say, oh, he has no, no, no problems with homosexuality because that would, in my mind, be unloving and that would be bad. Therefore, God actually endorses that type of lifestyle. No, that'd be that would be fallacious reasoning. That'd be the moralistic fallacy, confusing what we want to be true with what what is true. And so, people who actually care about reality don't want to base what they believe is true based on fallacious reasoning like that. It could be the case that God endorses homosexuality, but we would just be accidentally right if that is the case. If we're, we're that's the thought process we're using to come to that conclusion. It's just. A bad way of reading uh, any text. It's a bad way of thinking about uh, any concepts. It's it's a fallacy of logic. In this theological construct, people determine through philosophy what attributes God must have in order to be God, and then they attribute those attributes to God. Within the laity of Christian churches, this usually takes on the form of, of course he can't, because he's God. The argument is often framed that if God was unable to do some activity or action, then God would cease to be God. For example, if God did not know what I ate for breakfast yesterday, then he, by definition, would not be God. Within this context, people are assuming attributes they think God must have, and then dismissing any arguments to the contrary. God's attributes are determined, not by evidence, but by introspective thinking. This is not... I like that I use that example there about past knowledge, because that will kind of uh, be a good illustration for... Basically, everyone's going to say that God knows what I ate for breakfast yesterday, and so they'll be able to identify maybe their own biases in what they attribute to God. So, for the for the sake of this book, that was a good good uh, good. Th I I don't even remember I put that in there, but it was a good example to use for this portion. Not to say that classical theism does not have its own proof texts, but those proof texts have often assumed interpretations in line with negative theology and advocates discount interpretations that attempt to contextualize the verses. Several of these proof texts will be examined throughout this book, Malachi 3.6 and 1 Samuel 15.29 being... David points out that Thomas Ord is known for using moralistic type of fallacies, and um, I could probably, I could get along with anyone as long as we all know our, our priors, right? So if you know that somebody's just going to read the Bible, based on dignum dio or read the bible based on what they see as fitting of god and they understand that you're going to read the bible as a straightforward text trying to do some literary criticism uh trying to do some deconstruction um you could probably get a log because you understand that there you don't have that common overlap to argue about things what happens a lot on facebook or or any any christian sphere is Two people who have completely opposite ways of treating the Bible will start getting into arguments on secondary and tertiary areas where they don't even agree on the fundamental premises that they're arguing about. And so, of course, there's going to be this complete disconnect further down the line. In two prominent examples. Atheist George H. Smith, predictably, is frustrated by negative theology. He first explains what it is, and then explains why it is wholly unhelpful in understanding God. Quote, Some of God's attributes are obviously negative. Immutable tells us that God does not change. Ineffable tells us that God cannot be described. Infinite tells us that God is not finite. Invisible tells us that God is not visible. Even some terms that appear to be positive are essentially negative. 
to say that God is eternal, for instance, is to say that God is not subject to... Yeah, if you missed it, this is George H. Smith who is doing this quote. So George H. Smith is an atheist. He wrote Atheism, the Case Against God. That's a worthwhile book to read, to look at his thought process and his arguments. A lot of his arguments are against classical theism. He has other arguments as well. But it's it's not... It's not just a book that you throw in the trash because it's just complete biased nonsense. It, it actually has some good points. And I quote it often. I got a bunch of highlights in it. And his criticism of negative theology is definitely worth reading and checking out. To temporal succession. Furthermore, attributes such as omnipotence and omniscience signify capacities without limits. So they also stem, at least partially, from the negative way. While the negative so it is good to know or understand that in neoplatonism they wouldn't ascribe omniscience to god right so because or omnipotence to god in 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 normal platonism the christians were doing that because the christians are trying to fuse platonistic ideas onto the bible and so they're they they claim that these uh, omniscience on, and omnipotence are kind of these negative attributes because they're all encompassing. You'll you'll hear modern philosophers, theologians talk about how God's omniscience is in no way like ours. It's it's qualitatively different than ours because they still want it to be a negative attribute. But if you read Plotinus, he would he wouldn't have have uh, parts of knowledge within within the one because the one needs to be completely separate from creation it'd be the lesser gods or the outpourings which would have this type of omniscience attribute that we would normally associate with with god with deity so that that is one key distinction within platonism versus christianity and and the platonists were arguing with the christians about this the gnostics figure within Plotinus's work, he's arguing with them about attributes of deity. They have fundamental disagreements of what is included and what's not included, but it's an intra-Platonistic debate among fellow Platonists, Christian Platonists, and, and uh, the popular Platonism of that time. The way logically presupposes positive knowledge of God's nature, most of God's negative qualities, because they entail the inherent contradiction of the unlimited attribute, cannot be translated into positive terms. The negative attributes of God do not provide us with any real knowledge of God's nature. They are mere pseudo-attributes. Implicit within these characteristics is the premise, reason will never understand this. If the Christian wishes to use positive characteristics for God while retaining their meaning, he must reduce his God to a man-like or anthropomorphic level. On the other hand, if these predicates do not mean the same when applied to God as they do when applied to natural entities, then they assume some unknown mysterious meaning and are virtually emptied of their significance. I think C.S. Lewis wrote that God cannot love because God is love. And so C.S. Lewis was arguing in this uh, Neoplatonist type of way where qu qualitatively God's love is different than our love. He can't love like us because our love is in time, our love is give and take, and God has to be above those. And so George H. Smith is describing things that happen in normal Christianity. Close quote. A negative theology, a theology that distances God from his creation, is one in which God cannot be known in any real sense of the word. Any positive theology is undermined by negative theological assumptions. Biblical theism. The Bible, however, does not speak in this... So now, now it's back to me. This is uh, th my part of the book, and we're going to be quoting Walter Brueggemann uh, very shortly here, his Theology of the Old Testament, which... A top five books to read in Christianity, um, probably number one is Theology of the Old Testament, Walter Brueggemann. I highly suggest that book. It's it's a very innovative and eye-opening way of reading the Bible and understanding what's going on there. He's, he's very detailed. He's very straightforward. And he doesn't seem to let his biases control the reading. He does have like an entire chapter on like socialism and modern issues. You can just skip that stuff because he he goes off the wall there talking about all his uh, social justice type of things. Uh, maybe maybe like he he's like, oh, I'm t writing about the Bible so much. People are going to buy this and read this about the Bible. Might as well do a chapter on social justice. 
I don't know. Skip that chapter. But everything else is pretty good. This fashion of negative theology. Straightforwardly, the Bible emphasizes qualitative attributes. The Bible explains who God is. From world-renowned Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann in his Theology of the Old Testament, quote, Israel's testimony, however, is not to be understood as a claim subject to historical explication or to philosophical understanding. It is rather an utterance that proposes that this particular past be construed according to this utterance. For our large purposes, we should note, moreover, that such testimonial utterance in Israel is characteristically quite concrete. And only on the basis of many such concrete evidence does Israel dare to generalize. Close quote. Yeah, so this makes sense in in just our normal way that we we treat everything. So if if someone's nice, you describe someone as nice, that that's not a that's not an attribute that is concrete. And you have to interpret everything that person does through that attribute of niceness. Like uh, you say, Chris is nice, and I go kick a puppy. You're like that must have somehow been a nice act. Maybe he was saving a toddler's life by kicking that puppy. I don't know, something like that. That'd be the wrong way to go about shaping and constructing reality. Instead, what happens is you interact with someone over a period of time and you think of specific instances in which they've done things or how they behaved and you kind of build patterns in your mind and you say, oh, that guy's nice. Oh, he did this and he did this. He did this. He did this volunteer work. Oh, he has these kids and he plays with these kids and he, he did some altruistic things here and there. And then you you build generalities and your your adjectives they're they're not concrete they're not absolute but they are they're summarizing the data that you've accumulated over a period of time and that's what Walter Brueggemann is saying here that when Israel talks about God when they use adjectives about God th these attributes aren't just overriding and th they must be true no matter what because this is what it means to be God. No, instead what they do is they, they look at their past and, and their relationship with God and then summarize these, these points of data that they have in making these non-concrete statements. God is good and God is faithful because God led us out of Egypt. God saved us in the wilderness and, and fed us. God, God was with Abraham. God saved Noah. Th th there's concrete instances in the past that you can use that characterize these attributes. The attributes aren't true on their own, but a summary of past experiences. This is the opposite of how modern Christians read the Bible. They, they see an adjective and they say, oh, it says God is good. And so I got to turn back, oh, Boyd does this. He's like, I got to turn back to this passage here where God is declaring war and saying to exterminate men, women, children, animals. And then now I have to say, now, this doesn't line up with this other attribute I saw over here. And so somehow I got to deal with this passage such that it's not contradicting this more solid attribute that we have in this other place. That's just, that's not how characterizations work. That's not how generalizations work. And it's, it's probably pretty subjective anyways. What this is saying is that the Old Testament was not written with negative theology in mind. The text is not meant to be read in a cryptic way, assuming negative attributes over the text. The Old Testament was written to its audience to be taken at face value. And the text does not start with generalized attributes, such as God is almighty. But it provides examples and then sums up these examples by a generalization. God is not almighty because that is the starting assumption. God is almighty because he created the world, led Israel out of Egypt, and can manipulate entire nations to do his will. Yeah, we, we definitely see this at play in Isaiah 42 through 48, Deutero Isaiah, which God, Isaiah 40 through 48, in which God actually walks them through a bunch of instances in the past and then proclaims his own characteristics based on him walking through these past examples. So this is, this is a text that the Calvinists use to proclaim negative concepts of God. Oh, God predestines all things. And they turn to these texts. The whole text is God trying to explain uh, adjectives about himself through past examples to an audience who doesn't want to believe, doesn't want to listen. And he's trying to convince these people to worship him. That's the whole context 
Um, but it's 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 thrown out the window. They they read it and they say, oh, God is explaining his metaphysical absolute characteristics in the ether. That's not what's happening. That's not what's going on. Just just read the context, and that's why debates. As long as you could turn to the context and talk through the context, the context is never ne- never their negative theology. It's, it's never the metaphysics because none of the biblical authors were writing with metaphysics in mind. These these people did not have that categorically available. So all you have to do is turn to their proof text, read the proof text, and say that's just that's not what's going on here. Just read what's happening. How how does what you claim is happening? How does that fit the context? So there's there's different various com- concepts being communicated to the audience. He says this. He says this. He says this. Now he's going to make some weird metaphysical claim in the middle here, and then go on talking normal. That that's your guys' reading of it. That's not what's happening. It, it never is. God is shown to be almighty through his works. Alternatively, we do not know God is merciful because that's our starting assumption. But we know God is merciful because we have concrete examples of God's being merciful. For example, Jonah, Noah, David. Yeah, I also think it's a very huge mistake to think that there are absolute definitions of these adjectives somewhere that if someone someone is this adjective then they must do certain things in all these uh various certain circumstances that's probably a wrong way to understand how characterizations and generalizations work and so if people say god's nature is goodness and uh i all everything he does is good what do you do with that you you either have to have some sort of absolute standard that god is fulfilling at all times in all ways I just don't think that standard exists anywhere. And so then you then you have the Calvinist let's saying, "Oh, God is the standard." So no matter what God does is good. I don't I don't think that's the standard either. I think people have a general understanding, a general concept of what it means to be good, and if God generally fits that concept, it's it's okay to characterize him as that. I don't think there's an absolute standard, and I don't think that God is a standard and no matter what he does is good. He could torture babies for all eternity, um, just just cause the most horrific harm on them for all eternity and it'd still be good. I, I don't accept that. It's th- that there's nothing there's nothing that would suggest that that's the way reality works. And Israel. In the Bible, general attributes of God are formed based on specifics. There are no starting assumptions. Additionally, what this is saying is that it is improper to reinterpret the Bible to fit preconceived attributes. If God is said to be immutable, it's a mistake to take God changing his mind as depicted in texts such as Exodus 32 and then reinterpret those texts in light of immutability. This is dishonest to the text. The biblical method of describing God is by generalizing based on a wide field of specific examples. The examples lead us to the attributes rather than the attributes interpreting the examples. If a specific example contradicts an attribute, it is more honest to the text to view the attribute as a generality, a rule of thumb, than an absolute. This method of thinking, making generalizations, is fair. Yeah, so a lot of people, when they have a particular theology that they they really love and they, they really endorse, they don't like the idea that generalizations exist. Hyperbole exists. All of America has gone insane. Well, people understand. Well, what that means is that America is in general decline. It, it's it's a hyperbole, right? It's not like every single person has gone insane. And so sometimes you'll get statements in the Bible like Paul saying, all have sinned. And the Calvinist will see, see, says here, all have sinned. And you say, well, d- did Jesus sin? And then you get this this whole backtracking. They're, they're, they're taking it. They don't know how to respond at first. And they start coming up with excuses. And it's like a... It's a after the fact justification. They're like, well, well, uh, he's not one of us and he got the he's not included what he said. Well, OK, so you're giving exceptions now. All right. So then it's not all if you have to give exceptions and define the limitations of this all. So maybe maybe just admit that all doesn't have to mean all all typically has exceptions and generalizations do exist that all. Uh, all that God has called to Jesus, he's going to keep. Well, yeah, um, generally that happened, except for there were exceptions. There was Judas, who's as an explicit exception within the book of John. All doesn't typically mean all. Fairly mainstream in normal human communication. 
If a friend is described as nice, a specific time he was mean does not invalidate the attribute. Human beings do not operate with zero tolerance in adjectives. Yeah, I think this is so critical. Uh, this is totally discarded when we come to the Bible and start talking about God, that, that people don't want to allow tolerance in adjectives. They want adjectives to be absolute, with that inflexible, and, and their own personal standards rather than a standard outside themselves. It's a mistake to project a new standard onto the text of the Bible. Elsewhere, Brueggemann sums up another particularly glaring problem for the classical position. Quote, Israel's characteristic adjectival vocabulary about Yahweh is completely lacking in terms that have dominated classical theology, such as omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. This sharp contrast suggested that classical theology, insofar as it is dominated by such interpretive categories and such concerns, is engaged in issues that are not crucial for Israel's testimony about Yahweh, and are in fact quite remote from Israel's primary utterance. The Old Testament, in its discernment of Yahweh, is relentlessly committed to the recognition that all of reality, including the reality of Yahweh, is relational, relative to the life and destiny of Israel. And the God of Israel has no propensity to be otherwise than related to Israel. And so one of the key things that Brueggemann points out that everyone should understand and take away and, and keep in mind when you're reading the Bible is that the Bible itself is advocacy. So throughout Israel's history, not all of Israel worshipped Yahweh, worshipped God. God's always competing with the false gods, uh, the, the trial of the false gods, Isaiah 40 through 48. Um, Israel is wayward. They're, they're apostatizing. And so the Bible is written to tell them not only who God is, but why they should worship him. It, it's giving them practical guidance and an argument for what religion they should choose. And so keep that in mind. It, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, argue like a modern Calvinist would. And so a modern Calvinist, if they're going to a remote place in Africa or something like that, someone who's never heard of Jesus, they might, they might start talking about God with all these philosophical terms. Well, your God is anthropomorphic because uh, he in inhabits an idol or something like that, compared to God who doesn't change, is outside of time, and has all these, these specific properties. But the authors of the Bible didn't argue like that. They, they, didn't, they didn't talk like that. They didn't think like that. When Israel is worshiping the false gods and Israel thinks God doesn't see them, remember Ezekiel, he goes, God opens a door in the hill he goes through and he sees all the people worshiping all the idols in, in a covered location. And their conception of God was that God, God can see the whole earth but he couldn't see through the mountaintops. They, he couldn't see through roofs. He has an ocular vision, and it can be blocked by things like clouds. And Ezekiel's counterpoint was that, well, God has instant access to all facts as they arise uh, because that's his metaphysical. That's not his counterargument. His counterargument is, we're watching you guys do this. We're seeing you do this. Don't think you're hiding. There's nowhere you could run. There's nowhere you could hide. That's the counterargument. The counter argument is not negative theology. The counter argument is what God does, who God is. They had access to these. If any of these attributes were actual and true, any of these negative attributes, they would have used them. They would have said, hey, in Isaiah 40, they say, hey, all you false gods, see, they have change and, and they're, they're mutable and they're not timeless. And uh, so God is pure actuality with no potency and there could be only one of this because only one exists and so you need to start worshiping this pure action now, that not, none of them thought like that none of them argued like that that wouldn't make any sense god has to legitimately fight for worshipers and struggle with other deities that they could turn to right there's other deities that exist and exist as actual entities. Paul calls them demons. These these people exist. These persons exist, and other nations worship them. And God has to say, "No, these are the wrong ones. These are the bad ones. Come worship me." Close quote. The Bible is not filled with <coughs> theology that Christian theologians dwell upon. The ideas and concepts of negative theology are alien to the text. When texts are used to support this negative theology, they are ripped painfully out of context 
and would not make sense in context. As this book will illustrate, negative theology is just not found in the Bible. Biblical scholar Christine Hayes, professor at Yale University, notes, quote, It is important that readers not import into their reading of the Hebrew Bible their conceptions of a divine being generated by the later discipline of philosophical theology. The character, Yahweh, of the Hebrew Bible should not be confused with the God of Western theological speculation, generally denoted as, quote, God, unquote. Qualities attributed to the latter by theologians, such as omniscience and immutability, simply are not attributed to the biblical character Yahweh by the biblical narrators. Yahweh is often surprised by the actions of humans and is known to change his mind and adjust his plans in response to what he learns about human nature and behavior. Accordingly, one of the greatest challenges for modern readers of the Hebrew Bible is to allow the text to mean what it says, when what it says flies in the face of centuries of theological construction of the concept of, quote, God. Yeah, I do like Christine Hayes. She's just blunt about it. She's like, all these conceptions, because she has students, like, all you guys, you guys come here and you think all these properties apply to God? It's just not in the text. Um, That's that's a later construct. And so when you're here in my class, that's just like, read what the text says. And she's just very blunt about it. And she she gives a, a laugh in, in one instance in what she's talking about. Like, yeah, this is just, this is just not, yes, it's. It's almost like, oh, that's cute that you believe that, but it's just not there in the text. God changes his mind in the text. It's, it's just a fact of the text. And so I like how blunt she is about it because her bluntness has probably caused a lot of her students to stagger back and then reevaluate what they're doing with the Bible and where they're coming from and their pre their theological presuppositions. I would like to get a hold of any of these people that she had dealt with in her class who were uh, Calvinists or, or typical Arminians and, and see what they took away and if they had changes of minds. But I, I can assume that it would taking her class would cause a crisis of faith in a lot of Christians. Close quote. Comparing modern theology books to the Bible shows just how removed the modern mind is from the mind of ancient Israel. While Israel was dedicated to understanding who God is as a person in order to understand how God would act in the present, classical theologians focus on defining his internal essence to build a metaphysical picture of God. This task relies almost exclusively on speculation. Yeah, just just think about how alien that is to modern prayers. Modern prayers from Christians who think that God controls everything or has pre-planned everything, all their prayers would be like, we know that you have your perfect plan, a planned out, but can you cure my kid's cancer if that's in your will? It's like they they always have to hedge their bets because they don't actually see God as responding to prayer. And then they see whatever happens as part of God's meticulous foreordained plan. That's just not, we don't see people in the Bible praying like that. Uh, we, we see Jesus hedging God from changing, saying, Hey, God, um, I don't want this thing to happen, but I know you respond to prayers, so do your own thing and don't listen to my prayer if, if they conflict, right? Uh, the, the whole premise of prayer within the Bible is to change God's plans, get him to do other things, but modern Christians have turned that on their head just because of the way they conceptualize God. It's alien to the Bible. As the Bible is fairly silent on the matter. Where theologians err greatly is when their speculation differs from the biblical account. They tend to assume, without warrant, the biblical authors agree with their speculative metaphysics, negative theology, and then interpret the text in light of their metaphysics. If God is said to change his mind and not do what he said he would do, Jonah 3.10, to the theologian, obviously that cannot be the case. It is claimed that God really did not repent, and the text is not to be taken literally. But if the entire point of a text is to show God's mercy, then how can the text be assuming anything other than God's changing based on how people act? Not changing is not merciful. Mercy implies change. The text explicitly describes change. The author of Jonah cannot be shown or assumed to have accepted strange metaphysical notions of an immutable God. These claims are forced onto the text. When the biblical account of God's actions and character contradicts metaphysics, those claiming to be biblical scholars cannot, in good faith, disregard the Bible. Yeah, so we're going to probably stop there, but look at how this preface is 
is structured and how it flows. It introduces everyone to some basic concepts. What is open theism? What is classical theology? Uh, negative theology, how does that relate to classical theology? Dignum Dio theology. Let's talk a little bit about idioms and metaphors and understanding how, just kind of some basics of how language works. And uh, the chat, first chapter in this book goes in more depth. It starts talking about idioms and generalities. We need to start thinking in these terms. This, this is when we're reading any book, any book at all. I, I got that that short video about a Calvinist reads Pride and Prejudice. And what it's illustrating is nobody treats the Bible like a real book. They, they'll read a real book and they'll read it like a normal person. And then they'll turn to the Bible and all their normal reading comprehension techniques will go out the window. Everything's read in this absolute mechanical way. Edwin Hatch uh, he has a really good quote that I start chapter one off with, in which he talks about that the Bible, Bible's not written like a legal document. It's not written like uh, you would a technical manual. Instead, what the Bible, it's a, it's a normal book. It's filled with letters. It's, it's filled with history being written for common people. It's just normal language. We need to start treating it like normal language. And so the, this first chapter introduces us to what is open theism? Who is God? What are some general characteristics of God? How do these characteristics work and operate? They, they don't operate on a concrete metaphysical rules. They operate in a loose sense. We need to start reading language for what language is and stop pretending language is something it is not. It's not hard. It's not fast. It's not concrete. Language is loose. Language is flexible. Language is determined by context. Context means everything. And this is this is the point I was driving home to my kids because uh, they read through chapter one as well. And in chapter one, it talks a lot more about context and meaning. Um, just to drive that point home, context determines meaning. The words don't have meaning outside of their context. That's an incredibly important point. We need to start treating the Bible like a real document, treating the Bible like a book and stop treating the Bible like our own personal theological metaphysical guide that we can interpret however we want. That's just maybe they coincidentally, you could be right with the conclusions you draw from that sort of approach to the Bible, but chances are that's an invalid way to get anywhere close to truth. Anyways, let's say I always get a kick out Christians who call open theist heretics but say prayer works. Nearly every Christian is open theist when they pray. Most most people are open theists and don't know it. You talk to them, uh, they they conceptualize God as a guy watching the world and de deciding on things in the moment. Most people are open theists. It's it's just when you start talking to them about speculative metaphysics that their tune changes. But functionally and operationally, you could go to a Calvinist church for years and not hear a Calvinist sermon especially if they go text by text in the Bible, they, they do a systematic uh, studies or, or preach practically. You might never hear a Calvinistic sermon in a Calvinist church because not even Calvinists are really Calvinists when it comes down to it. Calvinists don't believe their own theology. It's impractical. The Bible is a practical document. Christianity is a practical religion. Practical in the way it's something you can practice. It gives, it gives ideas how to relate with God. It gives standards for behavior. It tells us what we should do and how we should do it. It tells us what we can do and what we shouldn't do and possible consequences. It's a, it's a practical document. It is not a metaphysical speculative theology. So that, that's my whole appeal with this entire book is to start treating the Bible as a book rather than some abstract metaphysical guidebook. That's that's not what it is. Anyways, um, my kids are getting restless, so I've got to take off. But uh, questions, comments, put that down below. Thank you for listening.